Hello everyone, and welcome to this virtual lecture course in Classical Mechanics and Relativity. I'm Dr Andrew Mitchell, and in the previous lectures we've been developing the Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics. In the last lecture in particular, we introduced the concept of phase space and canonical coordinates. Canonical coordinates are basically the generalised positions and momentum. In this lecture, I want to go a bit further and consider so-called canonical transformations. These are transformations of our coordinate system that involve both the generalised positions and the momentum. They scramble up the positions and the momentum, and therefore this is a more general and powerful transformation than the so-called point transformations that just involve the generalised coordinates alone. We'll see that a canonical co coordinate transformation is one that obeys the so-called Poisson bracket relations. In this lecture, we'll be introducing the Poisson brackets and exploring the properties of Poisson brackets. In particular, we'll see how the time dependence of observables, meaning the rate of change of some object, uh, is basically obtained by taking the Poisson bracket of that observable with a Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian, again, is controlling really the dynamics of the system, as well as the time dependence here of observables. So that will be covered in this lecture. So let's get down to work. So in the first part of this lecture, I want to consider the time dependence of observables. So consider some physical observable O of t. This is some observable that has a time dependence. It changes with time. However, this physical observable also is controlled by and depends on the independent variables of the system. So O is actually a function of the generalized coordinates, the generalized momenta, as well as time. It might have an explicit time dependence as well as an implicit time dependence. We refer to such an observable as a dynamical variable. So let's look at some examples of the kind of observables that we might consider in this lecture. For example, imagine I have a ball and I throw it vertically upwards and it uh, rises and then falls again due to the gravity. I could look at the time dependence of the kinetic energy. I would see that initially it had a high kinetic energy and then this kinetic energy reduced as it reaches its maximum height before increasing again. So this kinetic energy is a physical observable that has some time dependence that I could measure. Likewise, I could of course just measure the position of the particle, and so I could say that another observable might simply be the x position of the particle at a given time t. Or I could consider, for example, a mass at the end of a spring bobbing up backwards and forwards, in this case, there's potential energy that's stored inside the spring, and over time, as the, uh, as the mass bobs backwards and forwards, the amount of energy stored in the spring will change. Again, I can look at the time dependence of the potential energy. Or another kind of observable for this system could simply be the time period of the oscillation. Or it could even be the area of the phase space orbit. I could also look at completely arbitrary or general observables, Consider in the double pendulum system, I have these two generalized coordinates, theta 1 and theta 2, but I could consider uh, an observable of something, I don't know, we could consider, for example, the product of theta 2 times the cosine of uh, the velocity of the particle, something like this. I'm just picking this thing at random, but in principle, this object has a time dependence, and that is something that we can measure in the system. In the first part of the lecture, we'll be considering exactly how to obtain these time-dependent observables for a given arbitrary system. The central question is, what is the time dependence of a given observable along the trajectory of motion of the system? The trajectory itself is, of course, a particular trajectory through phase space, which follows according to the initial conditions and the Hamiltonian, and of course, Hamilton's equations of motion. Along the trajectory, the observable will change in time. How? To answer this, we first consider the functional dependence of our observable. So from this expression, we see that in general, the observable can depend on the canonical coordinates, the qi's and the pi's, as well as explicitly on time. So we can use this to express an infinitesimal of our observable, do, in terms of infinitesimals along the independent coordinate uh, directions. And for a system of n um, independent generalized coordinates, I can write the sum over j 
from 1 to n of partial do by dqj, dqj for the generalized coordinates, plus partial do by dpj, dpj. Those are the uh, infinitesimals along the canonical, canonical coordinate directions. And then we also have potentially a explicit time dependence do by dt, dt. And we play the usual trick we've seen a few times, which is to find the um, overall time dependence of the observable, which means do by dt, the total derivative. I can just divide this expression by dt. The last term, of course, dt by dt just gives me 1. Um, on the left-hand side, do by dt, this is the time dependence. This is the thing that we actually want. These other terms, dqj by dt, is, of course, just qj dot, whereas p, uh, dpj by dt is just pj dot, the time derivative of those quantities. Furthermore, we can now use Hamilton's equations of motion, which tell us something about the dynamics of the generalized coordinates and generalized momenta in terms of derivatives of the Hamiltonian. Specifically, I can write that qj dot is equal to partial dh by dpj, whereas pj dot is equal to minus dh by dqj. This gives me an expression for the time dependence of a physical observable, do by dt, in terms of these various partial derivatives. We get partial derivatives of the observable with respect to the canonical coordinates, and the partial derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to the canonical coordinates, plus this explicit time dependence, do by dt. All of this can be summarized into the following very important equation which basically defines the so-called Poisson bracket. On the left-hand side, we see the full time dependence of the observable. On the right-hand side, we see one piece which contains the explicit time dependence. And we'll see examples of what I mean by that later. The piece in the middle is the most interesting thing, this is the implicit time dependence, and it's given by this object called a Poisson bracket. The Poisson bracket for two functions phi and psi here is denoted by this curly bracket object with phi, comma, psi. The definition of this is the following. Here, we sum over all of the generalized coordinates j from 1 to n for a system of n degrees of freedom. And then we take derivatives of the functions phi and psi with respect to the canonical coordinates qj and pj. Specifically, we take this combination. So we take d phi by dqj times d psi by dpj minus the derivatives the other way around, d phi by dpj times d psi by dqj. Why do I define such an object? Well, as we saw on the previous slide, this is precisely the thing that gives us the time dependence of our observable O. So indeed, if I were to let uh, phi in here equal the observable O, and psi here be the uh, Hamiltonian H, then do by dt would be precisely given by this expression using this definition of the generalized Poisson bracket. You see here that I've been more general in writing down this definition of the Poisson bracket than simply writing in the Hamiltonian here. I'm here considering the Poisson bracket of any two functions, not just some observable function and the Hamiltonian function. So this is the definition of the generalized Poisson bracket and the definition of the time dependence of a given observable. Let's apply this to a few simple examples. Let's consider first, for example, h dot itself. This means the total derivative dh by dt. So just following this definition here, I would obtain that this 
is equal to the Poisson bracket of H with itself plus the explicit time dependence partial dH by dt. But what is this Poisson bracket of the function h with itself? Well, if we look up here with the definition of the generalized Poisson bracket for two arbitrary functions, we can see that if I have the same function h and h, then this first term will actually be equal to the second term, and the minus sign means that overall this thing will be equal to zero. So this term is actually equal to zero, and therefore, overall, we have that the total derivative h dot is equal simply to the partial derivative dh by dt. Let's consider another example. Let's consider the time dependence of a particular um, generalized coordinate qi. This just means d qi by dt, of course. And that means let's calculate the uh, Poisson bracket of qi with the Hamiltonian. And then I add on the explicit dependence dqi by dt. However, when we're talking about the generalized coordinates, those things are the independent variables of the system, and therefore there is no explicit time dependence to the generalized coordinates. So this quantity is actually zero. And what that tells us is that I can write qi dot simply in terms of the Poisson bracket qi with the Hamiltonian. In an exactly analogous way, I can write down the time dependence of the cano canonical momentum dpi by dt, or pi dot, simply as the Poisson bracket of pi with the Hamiltonian. But given that this is again uh, one of the independent coordinates of our system in, um, in Hamiltonian language, this is again equal to zero, and so I can write pi dot is equal to the Poisson bracket of pi with the Hamiltonian. What I've given here, h dot, qi dot, and pi dot, are precisely Hamilton's equations of motion. Hamilton's equations of motion tell us about the dynamics of the canonical coordinates. So we can learn from Hamilton's equations of motion the uh, time dependence of the uh, generalized coordinates, the qi's, and the time dependence of the generalized momenta, the pi's. We saw in the previous lecture how we can obtain that from partial derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to the canonical coordinates. What we have here is an alternative description. We can see that Hamilton's equations of motion can be written in terms of these Poisson brackets. What we see here is that um, the qi dots can be given as the Poisson bracket of qi with the Hamiltonian, whilst pi can be given as the Poisson bracket of pi with the Hamiltonian. Of course, in both cases, it's the Hamiltonian that controls the dynamics of the canonical coordinates, and therefore the phase space trajectories. So I can make an equivalence, therefore, that this Poisson bracket is actually alternatively written as dh by dpi, and this one is minus dh by dqi, using the other form of Hamilton's equations. These Poisson brackets also help us to understand something about conserved quantities. For a conserved quantity, we mean that the observable does not change in time. Therefore, do by dt is equal to zero, which tells us that the observable O is a constant and does not change in time. This is the property of a conserved quantity O. The Poisson brackets therefore tell us that the Poisson bracket of O with H plus the partial derivative DO by DT must be equal to zero because this is this whole thing here is the total derivative DO by DT. Furthermore, if there is no explicit time dependence, 
which basically means partial do by dt is equal to zero, then this implies something uh, important. It tells us that the Poisson bracket of the observable with the Hamiltonian must be equal to zero. If this is the case, we say that the observable commutes with the Hamiltonian. If a given observable O commutes with the Hamiltonian, it means that uh, that object is a conserved quantity and has no time dependence. In fact, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence here. If an object commutes with the Hamiltonian, then it's conserved, but also if we see something that's conserved, it means it must commute with the Hamiltonian. Another useful property is that if two quantities A and B are both conserved, if A and B are constants of motion and uh, constant as a function of time, then the Poisson bracket between them is also a conserved object. This actually provides a route to finding new conserved quantities. If I have two conserved quantities, I can compute their Poisson bracket and maybe find a third one. However, this does not always provide a useful result because the number of possible constants of motion is, of course, always limited by the number of degrees of freedom in the system. So the result may be something trivial, for example, a constant or a function of a and b. Nevertheless, it is always true that two conserved quantities a and b have a Poisson bracket that is also a conserved quantity. Let me briefly now say a word or two about the connection to quantum mechanics. If we consider some quantum mechanical operator O hat here, the hat denotes a quantum mechanical operator, then the time dependence of this operator is actually found in a very similar way. We can write that O hat dot, the time derivative, is actually equal to a similar kind of bracket plus the explicit time dependence. This bracket in quantum mechanics is called a commutator. And uh, we see that its prefactor here, instead of being 1, as in classical mechanics, is the imaginary unit i divided by h bar. So this is the quantum mechanical version of the Poisson bracket relations that we've just been considering. Now, unless there is an explicit time dependence to the operator O hat, then we can actually write that the expectation value of the time dependence, therefore, of a given operator is simply given by the expectation value of the commutator, of the operator with the Hamiltonian. And of course here, the Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics is itself an operator. So I won't say so much more about that now. Um, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that these things we're talking about in the framework of classical mechanics in terms of Poisson brackets, time dependence, and later on we'll talk about canonical transformations, all of that stuff naturally carries through into quantum mechanics in a very, very similar way. We just have to change the definitions of Poisson brackets for quantum mechanical commutators. That's basically the only difference. That's one of the reasons why this formulation of Hamiltonian mechanics is so powerful. OK, let's return back now to classical mechanics. With this definition of the generalized Poisson bracket for two arbitrary functions, phi and psi, in terms of derivatives over the canonical coordinates of a system, um, we can derive several important properties of these Poisson brackets, which can be useful for our later considerations. So let me just summarize here some of the important uh, properties of Poisson brackets, which one can derive directly from this formula here. These are a collection of the properties that I want to briefly discuss here. This first property here defines the anti-commutivity of the Poisson bracket. This means that if I have two functions phi and psi, I can put them into the Poisson brackets in either order, and the only difference I get between the two is this minus sign. That is directly obvious from this definition of the Poisson bracket. If I switch the order of phi and psi, 
that basically just switches the order of this term and this term, and therefore I get a minus sign. That property is known as an anti-commuting property. Also, in the second um, property here, we see that if I take the Poisson bracket of a function with itself, I get zero, and that actually follows from, um, from point number one, the anti-commutivity, if I have the same function. So we saw already the use of this when computing the time dependence of the Hamiltonian. There we, would, we obtain the Poisson bracket of h with itself, and we argued that it had to be equal to zero. Actually, it's more uh, general than that. If I take the Poisson bracket of any function with itself, I'll get zero. In the third relation here, I introduce a constant a. This is not a function, it's just a scalar quantity, a number. And that number can be factorized out of the Poisson bracket. Again, this follows simply from the definition of the Poisson bracket. If I'm taking partial derivatives of functions that contain constants, I can just take those constants out. We see a property of linearity of the equations in property number four. On the left-hand side, I see the Poisson bracket of phi plus gamma and psi, and I can just break that into two separate Poisson brackets involving phi with psi and gamma with psi. So this shows that this operation is linear, and of course we know it should be linear because here we're dealing simply with derivatives and uh, taking the derivative is a linear operation. Property five, however, is more complicated because we have the product of two functions, phi and gamma. Therefore, when we're taking the derivatives, we would need to use product rule, and therefore we get these two terms. This is basically product rule, but in this context, it has a special name. It's called Leibniz's rule. but basically it's product rule. And finally, we have this rather intimidating looking identity. This is something that involves these nested Poisson brackets. We see the Poisson bracket of, of phi with a Poisson bracket of gamma and psi. If we take cyclic permutations of these, phi, gamma, psi, gamma, psi, phi, then psi, phi, gamma, they follow a particular order that cycles round on itself. If we take all cyclic permutations and add them up, then we get zero. This is called the Jacobi identity. These are basically the most important uh, Poisson bracket relations. These relations also put the properties of Poisson brackets on a slightly more formal mathematical footing. If I take these relations, uh, numbers 3, 4, and 5, uh, these are the linearity, the uh, factorization, and uh, basically the product rule, then these properties are the defining properties of the so-called derivation. This is a formal generalization of differentiation. The action of a Poisson bracket with any given function on the class of all functions is therefore a derivation. Furthermore, the um, anti-symmetric property in property number one and the Jacobi identity in property six are two of the three defining properties of a so-called Lie algebra. Um, a Lie algebra, of course, works on a finite dimensional vector space, whereas here we're working on an infinite dimensional space of all functions. But apart from that, this is very closely related to a Lie algebra. We don't need to go into that any further in this course, but for those of you that want to read up more on that, this is the, the, the foundational mathematical basis for this theory of Poisson brackets. Uh, in what follows, we can actually use some of these uh, relations to manipulate our expressions. And in the end, we'll see that we can reduce any expression, however complicated, to the so-called fundamental Poisson brackets. And these are the Poisson brackets of the canonical coordinates themselves. So let's have a look at the fundamental Poisson brackets now. So these are the Poisson brackets of canonical coordinates. I can consider here, for example, a Poisson bracket of a given 
generalized coordinate qi with a different generalized coordinate qj. I can also look at the Poisson bracket between pi and pj, or between qi and pj. Together, these things constitute the fundamental Poisson brackets. So let's just use the definition of the generalized Poisson bracket to calculate the value of these specific Poisson brackets. So this is the result, where here we're summing over the canonical coordinates labelled k. In particular, from this expression, we see directly that if we have the partial derivative of a generalized coordinate qj with respect to the canonical coordinate pk, this has to be equal to zero automatically. And that's because uh, the q's and the p's are independent variables in the Hamiltonian formulation. So they don't depend on each other, and the partial derivative of a given q with any p is equal to zero. We have exactly the same argument for this term, and therefore that is also zero. And this basically wipes out every possibility in the entire Poisson bracket, leaving us with the fact that the Poisson bracket between any two generalized coordinates is always equal to zero. What about the Poisson bracket for the generalized momenta, pi with pj? So actually here we have a very similar argument because the p's and the q's are independent from each other. So again, this term will be zero and this term will be zero. The partial derivative of any p with respect to any q is equal to zero because p's and q's are independent parameters. So again, this is zero and this is zero. And so that kills off all the terms in the sum. And again, we see that the Poisson bracket is equal to zero. But what about taking the Poisson bracket of one generalized coordinate, qi, with one generalized momentum, pj? What happens then? Here we see something slightly different happens. In the second term, we have uh, dq by dp and dp by dq. So these terms, by the same logic, are definitely zero. But what about the first term? Well, different generalized coordinates are clearly orthogonal to each other. They're independent. And likewise, different generalized momenta are independent. But in this sum here, which runs over all of the generalized coordinates, if k is equal to i, then we have dqi by dqi, and that's equal to 1. What about the second term? If k is equal to j, then we'd have dpj by dpj, and that would be equal to 1. So both of these um, derivatives here are actually Kronecker deltas. They collapse the sum from i to k in this case, and from j to k in this case. And that means that the only term that can survive in this whole sum is if i is equal to j, and that is equal to the particular element in the sum, k. So overall, this whole Poisson bracket is actually equal to the Kronecker delta ij. The Kronecker delta means, of course, that this is equal to 0. If i is not equal to j, and it's equal to 1, if and only if i is equal to j. So together, we've now derived the fundamental Poisson brackets. The Poisson bracket of any two generalized coordinates are equal to 0. The Poisson bracket of any two generalized momenta are equal to 0. But the Poisson bracket of one generalized coordinate with one generalized momenta can actually be equal to 1, provided that we're talking about a generalized momenta that is conjugate to the generalized coordinate. As an example, let's take a look at a very simple system with one degree of freedom. Let's say that we have canonical coordinates x and px. We can therefore write down the fundamental Poisson brackets x with x. That will be equal to 0. We can write down px with px. That is equal to 0. And finally, we can write down x with px which would be equal to 1. And that's because we're talking specifically about the generalized momentum px conjugate to our generalized coordinate x. Earlier I mentioned the connection to quantum mechanics. Maybe I just bring that in one more time. 
in quantum mechanics, we have these things called commutators, and we can compute the commutator of the X operator in first quantization, and that would give us zero. Likewise, we can compute the commutator of the PX operator, and the commutator of PX with PX is again equal to zero. However, the quantum mechanical commutator of the X operator with the PX operator, we know, is I H bar. So again, we see a very similar structure going from classical Hamiltonian mechanics to quantum Hamiltonian mechanics, where the Poisson brackets are re uh, replaced by these commutators. And in particular, instead of X with PX um, in the classical uh, Poisson bracket equaling one, we see in the quantum world that the commutator of X and PX operators is actually I H bar. So canonical coordinates obey these fundamental Poisson bracket relations, which I've given again here. Indeed, this can be seen as the definition of canonical coordinates. The defining feature of canonical coordinates is that they obey these Poisson bracket relations. This, of course, begs the question as to whether the choice of canonical coordinates is a unique choice. And the answer there is no. There are other coordinate choices we can make that would also satisfy the fundamental Poisson bracket relations. The coordinate transformation from one set of canonical coordinates to another set of canonical coordinates is referred to as a canonical transformation. Imagine we have a set of canonical coordinates. If we perform a coordinate transformation to a new set of canonical coordinates, then these must also obey the fundamental Poisson bracket relations. If they do, then this is called a canonical transformation. Such a transformation is more general than the ones we've been considering hitherto, because it allows us to involve both the generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta in the transformation. I can write, for example, a new coordinate qi, which is a function of the old canonical coordinates, meaning all of the q's and all of the p's, and it could also be a time-dependent transformation. Likewise, I can write a new generalized momentum, big PI, which is related again to the canonical coordinates, the Q's, the P's, and also in general T. Compare this with what we had previously, which was a point transformation, meaning that we transform only the generalized coordinates into a new set of generalized coordinates. In a canonical transformation, we can scramble up all of the generalized coordinates and also the generalized momentum. A transformation is said to be canonical only if the fundamental Poisson bracket relations are preserved by the transformation. Specifically, this means that if we were to calculate the fundamental Poisson brackets of our original set of generalized coordinates, they would obey the Poisson bracket relations. Likewise, if we perform the same calculations on the new set of coordinates, that's the big p's and q's, then we would find the same relations. So these Poisson bracket relations are preserved by the canonical transformation. So the fundamental Poisson brackets are therefore canonical invariants. This phrase means that if we perform a canonical transformation, the fundamental Poisson brackets are left unchanged. They do not depend on the transformation. Why is this important? Well, basically, it's important because we can write the Poisson brackets of any functions in terms of the fundamental Poisson brackets. We can do this by using the uh, properties of the Poisson brackets that I introduced earlier in the lecture, the properties of linearity, the product rule, the Jacobi identity, all of those things, we can use them to break down complicated Poisson brackets into the fundamental Poisson brackets. And we know that these fundamental Poisson brackets don't depend on the canonical transformation. So that means that any Poisson bracket we can write down will be unchanged under these same transformations. In turn, this is important because and the Hamilton equations of motion can be cast in terms of Poisson brackets. Finally, this must imply, therefore, that the equations of motion, and therefore the underlying dynamics, do not depend on canonical transformations.
Hamilton's equations themselves are actually canonical invariants. The form of the equations does not change when we perform a canonical transformation. OK, so let's unpack some of that in more detail. So first of all, using the Poisson bracket properties, we can always express any Poisson bracket in terms of the fundamental Poisson brackets. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say for a system with one degree of freedom uh, and therefore a two-dimensional uh, phase space, let's say I wanted to calculate the Poisson bracket of the x-coordinate with, let's say, the kinetic energy of a particle. This kinetic energy can be expressed as px squared over 2m, where m is the mass of the particle. The mass is just a constant, and so I can actually use one of the Poisson bracket relations to factorize out that constant, leaving me with the Poisson bracket of x with px squared. Now I can use the Leibniz rule to express this in a different way. I can write this now in terms of these Poisson brackets involving only the canonical coordinates, and those things are preserved under a canonical transformation. In particular, I know that this object is equal to 1, and that's the same as this object. That's equal to 1 when I use canonical coordinates. And so overall, the Poisson bracket is simply px over m. The fact that I can express any arbitrary Poisson bracket involving any arbitrary function of the canonical coordinates in terms of the fundamental Poisson brackets, as I've shown here, indicates that when I switch to a new set of canonical coordinates, um, the value of these Poisson brackets will remain unchanged because the value of the fundamental Poisson brackets is unchanged. So for example here, if I were to make a canonical transformation such that x is some function x of the original little x and px, and the big px is now some function of, again, the original canonical coordinates. If this is a canonical transformation, then it tells me that the Poisson bracket of x and the kinetic energy t will again just be px over m, uh, where now I'm using the, uh, the new coordinates rather than the old ones. So the form of the Poisson brackets is unchanged when I make a canonical transformation. So the punchline is that canonical transformations preserve all Poisson brackets. In particular, physical properties cannot depend on our arbitrary coordinate choice. Therefore, they must be expressible in terms of Poisson brackets, which are canonical invariants. Therefore, we have a freedom to choose different coordinate systems, and this is an example of a so-called gauge freedom. Importantly, Hamilton's equations of motion themselves are canonical invariants. What I mean by this is the form of those equations is not changed by performing a canonical transformation. We can see this fact by writing Hamilton's equations of motion in terms of the Poisson brackets. In particular, as we saw before, we can write the time dependence of the generalized coordinate qi in terms of the Poisson bracket of the coordinate qi with the Hamiltonian. Likewise, we can write the time de dependence of the canonical uh, momentum pi in terms of the Poisson bracket of pi with the Hamiltonian. But since the Hamiltonian is itself a function of the canonical coordinates, the p's, the q's, and in principle time as well, that means that I can write these uh, Poisson brackets in principle just in terms of the canonical coordinates and Poisson brackets containing the canonical coordinates.
So using the properties of the Poisson brackets, I can express these in terms of fundamental Poisson brackets of canonical coordinates. And we know that the fundamental Poisson brackets are canonical invariants. That means that after a canonical transformation, I can write that big qi dot is equal to the Poisson bracket of big qi with the Hamiltonian, and big pi dot is equal to the Poisson bracket of big pi with the Hamiltonian. The form of Hamilton's equations is left unchanged by the canonical transformation. Indeed, we can express these in terms of derivatives of the Hamiltonian with respect to the new coordinates in exactly the same way as we would have done in the original coordinates. So the importance of the Poisson bracket stems from the underlying invariance of Hamiltonian dynamics. Just as Newton's second law holds in any inertial reference frame, there is a class of canonical coordinates which preserve the form of Hamilton's equations. Importantly, when we're working with the Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics, we are allowed far more transformations of the variables than with the Newtonian or even the Lagrangian formulations. And that's because we can scramble up not only the uh, generalized coordinates, but also the generalized coordinates and the momenta. Providing that this transformation preserves the fundamental Poisson brackets, then we know that the form of Hamilton's equations will remain unchanged. And since canonical transformations can interchange or mix up the roles of the generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta, we call them canonically conjugate. So within the Hamiltonian framework, positions and momentum kind of lose their independent meaning, except they always come in conjugate pairs. And of course, this is a property that is shared with quantum mechanics. Hamiltonian mechanics, in terms of the canonical coordinates, has a so-called symplectic structure. In the last lecture, I introduced this uh, notation, which is a vector of all of the canonical coordinates. So this vector eta here involves uh, q1, q2, q3, and so on, all of the generalized coordinates up to qn. And then we have the generalized momenta, p1, p2, p3, and so on, all the way up to pn. So for a system of n degrees of freedom, we have a vector here of dimension 2n. I can then define the time derivative of this vector, eta vector dot, as just simply the total derivative d by dt of the vector eta. And according to the time dependence of operators and the relation to the Poisson brackets, I can actually write this in terms of the Poisson bracket of the vector eta with the Hamiltonian. And so in a very concise way, we're able to express all of Hamilton's equations of motion for a system with n degrees of freedom. Now suppose we affect some kind of coordinate transformation. We'll say that some vector eta primed is related to the old vector through some matrix M. So if you imagine this matrix M here is an, a 2n by 2n matrix that scrambles up all of the components of our vector eta to give our new vector eta primed. This is the most general linear kind of coordinate transformation that I can write down on my canonical coordinates. Previously, we argued that a coordinate transformation is canonical if the form of Hamilton's equations of motion remains unchanged. And this means explicitly in a mathematical form that I should be able to write down eta vector dot primed is equal to the Poisson bracket of eta vector primed with the Hamiltonian. So the question is, what are the conditions on our transformation, which is parameterized by this matrix M, which guarantee that the form of Hamilton's equations are left unchanged, and therefore that we don't just have any old coordinate transformation, but specifically 
Economical transformation. Well, to work out the direct conditions for when we have a canonical transformation, we need to delve a little bit deeper and understand the symplectic structure. Let's first consider the simplest possible system of one degree of freedom, which therefore has canonical coordinates q and p. We can write down Hamilton's equations. as a vector form q dot and p dot is equal to dh by dp and minus dh by dq. So we see here that the p's and the q's are intertwined. So the q dot depends on dh by dp and the p dot depends on dh by dq. And this is where the word symplectic comes from. The origin is from the Greek, meaning intertwined. We also notice something interesting, which is this funny minus sign in here on one of the equations. So we're able to write this in terms of our vector notation. I can write this as eta dot on the left-hand side. That's fairly straightforward. But on the right-hand side, I need to account from, for the symplectic intertwined structure. And I can do that through this matrix that I'll call J. And I'll multiply the matrix J by dH by d eta. So for a, a simple one degree of freedom system, we can just write down straight away that this matrix J must be a two by two. And it has these off-diagonal terms. It's 0, 1, minus 1, 0. These off-diagonal terms do the intertwining. It means that the Q is related to dH by dP, and the P is related to dH by dQ. Furthermore, this minus sign here is accounted for by the minus sign in the J. OK, let's generalize now to two degrees of freedom. Our eta vector is now q1, q2, p1, p2. And we have exactly the same. I can write the Hamilton's equations of motion in the same form, but this time I just have a different definition for the matrix J. Here we have a matrix J which has to be a four by four matrix. And if you think about the structure, it has the following. It has this kind of block diagonal structure. We see um, that we still have the minus ones in this bottom corner and the plus ones in the top right corner. But now the 4 by 4 matrix has a block superstructure. Indeed, we can emphasize that this has a block structure in the following way. We could imagine breaking up this 4 by 4 into 2 by 2 blocks. And these two by two blocks are either zero on the diagonals or the identity matrix of dimension two on the off diagonals, where I also have this minus sign here. And actually, that turns out to be a good guess because this is exactly what you get when you generalize to n degrees of freedom. In general, we still have the equation of motion written in this form. with a specific form of this J matrix, which now involves these N by N blocks. And this J matrix encodes the symplectic structure of the problem. Okay, so let's now return to the question of when we have a canonical transformation.
we imagine that we transform from the eta to the eta primes through some generic matrix M. What are the conditions on M for us to have a canonical transformation? Well, a canonical transformation preserves the form of Hamilton's equations. And that means that we have this exact same form of Hamilton's equations as we had up here. The j is exactly the same, that doesn't depend on the coordinate system, but we just replace etas by eta primes. We can now substitute in this expression for the transformation, and by comparing the equation of motion in the primed reference frame to the unprimed reference frame, we can get a condition upon m for having a canonical transformation. And this is the final condition, that the matrix transformation m times j times the transpose of the matrix m must be equal to j itself. So only special kinds of transformations that satisfy this property would be regarded as canonical. They're the ones that preserve the form of Hamilton's equations, and indeed they pre preserve the form of all Poisson brackets. So this is rather abstract. Let's do a couple of examples to really see this in action. In practice, it is sufficient to show for a given coordinate transformation that it is a canonical transformation by simply confirming that in the new variables, the Poisson bracket relations hold. So here's an example. For a system of one degree of freedom, show that the following transformation is canonical. So you can imagine this as a kind of exam question. Now you might be thinking, for a system of one degree of freedom, surely there's not much we can do. Surely it's a very, very simple problem. But as I mentioned earlier, the space of different canonical transformations is always very, very rich. Let me illustrate that with the following example. We start off with canonical coordinates little p and little q, and we transform to a new set of coordinates big P and big Q. And the coordinate transformation that I've suggested here is that big Q is equal to the arc tangent of Q upon P, and that the big P is equal to a half of P squared plus Q squared. So this is a highly non-trivial um, relation here. And what I'm asking is, is this transformation that I've written down a canonical transformation? The way to establish that in the simplest way is to simply show that the fundamental Poisson brackets in the new variables are equal to the, uh, the usual Poisson bracket relations that we know and love. So the task is to show that the fundamental Poisson brackets hold in the new coordinates. How do we do that? Well, we just compute the Poisson bracket big Q with big Q, but actually this is automatically equal to zero simply by the definition of the Poisson brackets themselves. If I take the Poisson bracket of a function with itself, it's equal to zero. So this is kind of a special property of it being a single degree of freedom here. Likewise, the Poisson bracket of big P with big P is equal to zero. What we have to show, therefore, is the remaining non-trivial one, which is the Poisson bracket of big Q with big P. What is this equal to? <clears throat> well, from the definition of the Poisson bracket, we can write this in the following way. In terms of derivatives of the new coordinates with respect to the old coordinates. This is uh, fairly straightforward to compute in practice because I have explicit expressions for the big P and big Q in terms of little p and little q, so I can really go ahead and compute all of these derivatives. In particular, if I calculate the partial derivative of big q with respect to little q, then, and this might take a little bit of work, but it's not so hard, I obtain the following, p upon p squared plus q squared. Whereas, if I calculate the partial derivative of big P with respect to little p, then from this expression, it's very straightforward to see that that just gives me P. <clears throat> if I calculate the derivative of big Q with respect to little p, I get minus Q upon P squared plus Q squared. And if I take the derivative of big P with respect to little q, then I simply get Q. So overall, what do I get? I get the product of these two terms, and I subtract from it 
product of these two terms. What does that give me overall? Overall, it gives me 1. And that's exactly what I need. The fundamental Poisson bracket for Q and P is equal to 1. So here I've shown by direct calculation that these coordinates, big P and big Q, are canonical coordinates precisely because they satisfy the fundamental Poisson bracket relations. OK, let's do another example. This is to verify that big P is equal to the product of little p times little q, and big Q is equal to log little q is a canonical transformation. So we can do exactly the same thing as before. We just have to show that the fundamental Poisson bracket relations are satisfied. And as before, because we have a system of one degree of freedom, the Poisson bracket of Q with itself and P with itself are actually automatically satisfied. But the Poisson bracket of Q with P is certainly less obvious. And that's what we need to calculate. And indeed, what we want to show is that's equal to 1. So let's just go ahead and do a direct calculation. From the definition of the Poisson bracket, I can write the following. And again, just evaluate all of these explicitly. This first term gives me 1 over q. This second term gives me q. This third term is 0. And the final term is p. But overall, when I multiply all this together, I get 1. So indeed, this is, again, a canonical transformation. So let's use this canonical transformation to help us out now with a little bit of physics. So the question is to solve the following Hamiltonian to find the phase space trajectories. This is the Hamiltonian. I have the sum of two terms. The first term is clearly the kinetic energy, p squared over 2m. The second term is a kind of potential, but it's a 1 over q squared kind of potential. And this whole thing, a Hamiltonian, it's uh, equal to the total energy. So here I have a system where the Hamiltonian is equal to the energy. The problem, therefore, is basically the following in, in cartoons. Imagine that I have the energy here plotted against a generalized coordinate, uh, x. I have a potential, which is this 1 over x squared potential. I have some particle in this potential and it's basically rolling down this potential well uh, towards the bottom. So here, the potential V is A upon 2Q squared. And the motion of a particle in, with some initial conditions will be basically to uh, increase in the x direction as the potential decreases. We'll have a transfer of the uh, potential energy to the kinetic energy because overall, the total energy is conserved. OK, so let's use the canonical transformation to help us out solve this problem. First of all, let's invert these equations that I wrote up the top here and write that um, little q is equal to e to the big Q. That's just coming from exponentiating both sides of this equation. We also see that little p is equal to big P over little q, which is therefore equal to big P e to the minus big Q, using this expression we've just derived. I can now substitute these expressions into the Hamiltonian. h is therefore, in these new variables, equal to big P squared over 2m plus a over 2 into e to the minus 2 big Q. This thing is still equal, of course, to the total energy e. So I obtained this expression for the Hamiltonian simply by plugging in these expressions for little p and little q into our original expression for the Hamiltonian.
and then I obtain this. And this implies, by the way, and I'll use this later, that e to the q, it can be written in terms of the total energy and the momentum simply as p squared over 2m times the total energy plus a over 2 times the total energy to the power of 1 half. So this quantity e to the q is actually equal to the original q variable. So therefore I can write that this whole expression that I've just derived here is equal to little q. So to solve for the phase space trajectory of q of t, basically what I need to know is the big P of t. So how to find the big P of t? I'm going to do that by using Hamilton's equations of motion. The important thing is that Hamilton's equations take exactly the same form in the new coordinates, the big P and big Q, as they did in the old coordinates, little p and little q, precisely because it's a canonical transformation. And we proved in this first part of the question that indeed this is a canonical transformation. Okay, so let's write down Hamilton's equation of motion for momentum. I can write down that p dot is equal to minus dh by dq. These are in the new variables. This is actually extremely easy to solve uh, because I have this common factor of q in this expression here. So I can write that down. It's very simple to see that this is just p squared over 2m plus a over 2 into e to the minus 2q. That whole thing is simply twice the energy that we started with. So the beauty of this canonical transformation is that I have a very straightforward uh, Hamiltonian equation to solve. I have that p dot is equal to 2e. This is a constant. And therefore, I can solve this to find big P of t is simply equal to 2e t plus some constant of integration c. So now I can combine this expression for q with this expression for big P and finally find the phase space trajectory that I'm after. I could write down that q of t is equal to this expression in terms of the total energy E. I can also find little p of t from this expression, given that I now know big P of t and little q of t. And I think you'll agree from looking at this expression, this is highly non-trivial. You couldn't just guess that. Um, this is something that really helps that we're able to reduce the complexity of Hamilton's equation of motion to something so simple. This is, of course, in the rotated coordinates. In the original basis, the trajectory actually looks rather complicated. So this would be a good example of the utility of performing canonical transformations. So finally, for systems with multiple degrees of freedom, there are always a very rich range of possible canonical transformations, as we've seen in the last couple of examples. There is always some choice of the canonical coordinates in which the equations of motion become trivial, but finding this transformation then becomes the whole difficulty. In fact, in quantum mechanics, we have something rather similar. The Hamiltonian becomes trivial in the so-called eigenbasis. This is the basis that diagonalizes the Hamiltonian, and we have Schrodinger's equation, which applies for each eigenstate separately. The Hamiltonian can be brought into this diagonal form using a canonical transformation. For example, block states of electrons in a periodic lattice are obtained by transforming from the real space to the momentum space using a Fourier transformation. And in fact, a Fourier transformation is an example of a canonical transformation. So in this lecture, we've seen quite a few things. We talked a lot about canonical transformations. We talked about how we can use Poisson brackets to calculate the, uh, the time dependence of variables, but we also understood Hamilton's equations of motion themselves in terms of the Poisson brackets. We saw that Hamilton's equations of motion are canonical invariants, meaning the form of those equations is unchanged by performing a canonical transformation.
In fact, that basically serves as a definition for a canonical transformation. It is a generalized coordinate transformation, which leaves the form of Hamilton's equations unchanged. It doesn't necessarily leave the Hamiltonian unchanged, but Hamilton's equations are left unchanged. This is very similar to uh, the situation in Lagrangian mechanics, when we performed uh, coordinate transformations from Cartesian, let's say, to spherical polar coordinates or something like this, then we saw the form of the Euler-Lagrange equation was left unchanged. Here we have something a bit more grand and a bit more powerful because the canonical transformation is a much richer kind of transformation that can scramble up not only the, uh, the generalized coordinates amongst themselves, but also scramble up the coordinates and the momentum. In the end, these canonical transformations are ones which leave the fundamental Poisson bracket relations unchanged. And this is the ultimate test for whether or not a transformation is canonical.